If this is your first year with a polytunnel or you're looking to get a polytunnel, then I've made this little masterclass video for you because there's so many different things to think about when it comes to polytunnel growing, i.e. growing undercover. Firstly, what is a polytunnel? Well, a polytunnel is, is a bit of a broad term, a bit like uh, undercover growing is a broad term. You get different brands of polytunnel behind me as first tunnels. In the original garden, it's a solar tunnel. Uh, you can then get kind of like polytunnel type undercover growing like polycrubs. On this permaculture experimental site, we've now got four different polytunnels here. Now, in terms of a temperate climate, so a temperate climate is like that in the UK where we get cold winters and kind of like warm, humid summers, and there's frost and there's some snow, but then there's some sun. Having a polytunnel allows us to extend our growing season. Usually they say with an extra layer of covering, like an extra layer of plastic, which by the way, for a polytunnel is usually UV stabilized and if as long as you don't rip it too much the polytunnel covering should last you around about 10 years now for a single layer of plastic it extends your growing season approximately by four weeks either side so say my growing season starts here mainly around like may time if i'm wanting to plant outside well with a polytunnel that can be april time just so you're thinking about things it also means towards the end of the growing season it stays a lot warmer so your growing season finishes four weeks later because you've got that extra layer of protection you can get clever you could put a little cold frame inside of the polytunnel so you've got double protection and one of the key benefits about polytunnels especially during cooler or colder winters or places that do get cold winters is that firstly you don't get snow you'll have to knock snow off but you don't get snow inside it also doesn't rain inside so you've got to make sure it doesn't dry out but it doesn't get snow and it maintains a higher ambient temperature than the outside which means if you're wanting to grow say winter salads for example or you're wanting to overwinter some beetroot or carrots then doing it in a polytunnel is going to be a lot more favorable polytunnels come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes we've got a mini one in one of the other gardens this is around six by three meters you can get absolutely massive ones but what you tend to find if you're looking at buying a polytunnel there is definitely a correlation where the bigger the polytunnel is, the cheaper each square meter or each square foot of growing space is. And so looking at maybe a, a three by five meter polytunnel, it's not gonna cost you that much extra to get a three by seven meter polytunnel. I've calculated that if you do it right, a polytunnel should be able to pay back in around two growing seasons, but that's gonna be a whole different video. It's important to know some of the other key benefits of a polytunnel, especially if you're trying to justify this kind of investment for your growing journey. In terms of a tool for self-sufficiency, I think it's essential. One of my absolute favorite things about the season extension of a polytunnel is it allows me to start seedlings indoors in modules or undercover in modules before it's too cold to sow them directly outside and when the temperatures warm up a bit i've then got seedlings which are four to six weeks old that i can plant straight off straight out and they can get underway and you're really utilizing that space. The other thing I love about having a polytunnel is over winter time, I actually have almost like a, an outdoor indoor office. It's a nice bright space, but I can take a flask of hot chocolate inside. I can use a potting bench, a bit like a workbench if I want to. It's just nice to have something where you don't have to be at home, but you can still kind of be protected, whereas outside it might just be way too grim to even worry about sitting down. I mean, like, yeah, it, it, it can be a very dull time winter. A polytunnel as well in a temperate climate helps you grow higher value crops or crops that prefer warmer climates more successfully. So I, I, you know, I can grow cucumbers outside. These are market more. I've got around, well, nearly 20 kilos out of this hotbed alone of market more. But things that I do struggle to grow outside in this climate is tomatoes. I can grow them outside, but they usually su succumb to blight really early on. Whereas when I have them in a polytunnel, uh, I can just get loads of tomatoes. On average, I'm getting about 10 kilos per square meter uh, of tomatoes at the moment. But I've also got aubergines in there and I've also got chilies. And I, I wouldn't dream of being able to grow those successfully outside. There's so many different methods of growing food. We've got raised beds, containers, 
polytunnels, hotbeds. We can even grow in compost bins. But polytunnel is definitely high up there in terms of the most valuable growing space because of the bigger variety or the wider range of crops that you can grow in it and also the season extension that it enables. And so in terms of per square meter, what is the most valuable growing space? Very often a polytunnel is right at the top of that list. An important aspect of placing a polytunnel is the orientation. Should it be north to south? or should it be east to west? Now, east to west works nicely if you want a, a, a lot of exposure, a big south facing exposure. That's what I've done for this polytunnel. I've got all of my tomatoes at the south end side, enjoying all of the sun, and they create a nice dapple shade for my other crops on the bed opposite. But you can also position it north to south. So as the sun goes from east to west, you ensure that everything within the tunnel at least gets some full direct sunlight. It's really down to you and also your position. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Whether it's north to south or east to west, it's gonna work absolutely fine. If you can, try and situate your polytunnel in a fairly sheltered space because there have been times where polytunnels can succumb to storms and, uh, and get blown off or blown away. But what's nice now is when you're buying polytunnels, there's lots of different ways of choosing the types of foundation. So these ones have anchor plates, so they stay in nicely. And you can get little upgrades where it ensures that the metal securings within the polytunnel um, have like storm strength upgrades. But if you can, try and position it nice and sheltered. Now a polytunnel has two ends and you want to make sure that you have a door at both ends in order to be able to open that to ventilate because if you don't have ventilation within the polytunnel you can get stagnant air and that's quite a bit of a breeding ground for a lot of pathogens and diseases which you don't want. You've got to think about what is your main entrance to the polytunnel. So for me it's it's the one behind me, so I've got a nice simple sliding door, but at the back it's just a door on a hinge. If you can, try and go for a wider door, it's always useful. Um, and the back door, it really just doesn't matter. Just make sure you have a way of ventilating. If you are in quite a hot climate, a polytunnel can get too warm over the summer months. But a way of combating this is that you can invest in some shades netting that you can drape over the top of a polytunnel on really hot days just to protect the plants inside. Within a polytunnel, you can put in containers, you can put in raised beds, you can just grow directly in the ground. It's totally up to you. I, w I usually make raised beds the same way as I do outside. So I will fill the bottom half with like a 50-50 mix of topsoil and maybe some old cow manure and then add like a five centimeter or two inch layer of compost on the top and just grow into that. But you can really change around what happens. It's nice to make sure that you do have a potting bench and seating area. If you wanna maximize space, you can then grow things like chilies in containers that you can then move about if you want to create some seating space. But one of the most important things to understand as I mentioned before, it doesn't rain in a polytunnel. Unlike going outside, you've got to think really carefully about how you want to approach watering your beds. My absolute go-to system is always soaker hoses. I see some people saying that soaker hoses are a little bit old fashioned and I'm like, yeah, but a lot of old fashioned things still are sometimes the best just because they're old-fashioned doesn't mean that they don't work. I much rather bury a soaker hose system within the beds than worry about maybe like setting up a micro drip but that's my personal preference. So I like to put down soaker hoses and then it's simply a case of plugging it into the hose at one end leaving it for say 30 minutes and the whole bed is watered. Now over say spring and summer, what you want to do is just ensure consistent watering. If you're growing things like tomatoes, they want regular or consistent watering, not erratic, because if they are really dry and suddenly get loads of water, you can get things like your fruits uh, start to crack and that isn't something that you really want. So regularity is good. I usually water twice a week to ensure that there's constant moisture in the soil. If the top two inches or top five centimeters of soil is really dry, that's a really good symbol or signal that it's time to water your beds. Over winter, you really want to cut back on watering. There's far less solar energy, and so there's far less evaporation. And if you maintain the same watering, what you're gonna to lead to is a lot of mold issues. And so ventilation over winter on like nice, pleasant days is really important to keep the doors open, but also 
you do cut back your watering to maybe only once or twice a month. Just don't make the mistake like I used to do where you just forgot watering for four months and then you kind of like came back in March and it was like the Sahara Desert and uh, that requires a, a, an incredible amount of water um, and organic matter to try and bring that back into life. It's just not worth it. One of the best things you can do to ensure healthy soil in polytunnels is just to have plants growing it all through winter. Now, in some cases, you may not have a soaker hose or it might be a really small bed and it doesn't make sense to use a soaker hose and you might not have a micro drip system. So in that case, getting a long spray lance is really useful because when you're watering, you want to water as close to the base of the plants as possible. And in a polytunnel, if I'm growing a lot of stuff, it can feel like a bit of a jungle. And if I'm crouching down, I might squash the aubergine plant behind me and I don't want to do that and so if I have a long spray lance I can stay stood upright I'm not squashing any of the jungle around me and I can make sure that I'm watering right down at the base. For the vast majority of the time I treat my beds in a raised bed the same way as I do outside very much a no dig base system where I'll then add a mulch of compost of like three to five centimeters like one to two inches every single year usually it's kind of late winter into early spring for a polytunnel and if I'm growing really hungry crops like tomatoes I will dig a hole and I will add more fertility at the base of the hole as well just to give them an extra boost. One of the things that I'm never against is doing occasional supplementation every three weeks or so with a, a natural liquid feeds as well that can be a nice little boost for your plants that are growing inside a polytunnel. In terms of pests there's both benefits and drawbacks for a polytunnel. So it's a little bit harder to hide crops around so it's harder for pests to find. That's much easier outside where there's a lot more space. I usually find it easier to group different crops together purely for management and different water needs in a polytunnel. And so there's things like um, rodents and birds especially I've had the most problems with. I've never really had problems with slugs in a polytunnel which is a really nice thing. But for, for birds there's a very simple way of dealing with that. You can just drape netting or add wire mesh in front of the doorways that you can then move whenever you're accessing. And in terms of rodents, they, they do like that kind of warmer area um, that a polytunnel has. So one of the things that I would do is just make sure that your potting bench is nice and clear. It isn't a big state and it isn't like places for rodents to hide underneath. And provided that you keep a nice clean open space whenever possible, you're never really gonna get into too many problems. One of the most exciting things I think that a polytunnel can offer is that you can do a, a food forest style polytunnel if you want to have a little bit of fun because you can grow kind of like half hardy plants or half hardy fruits within a polytunnel that would really struggle to grow outside. One of the best ones I've ever seen is of a polytunnel food forest in the Shetlands, um, the Isles of Shetland, which are like really far north of Scotland. Um, I made a video there many, many years ago. There's a link down below, but that kind of shows you what can be done. Now they are growing in polycrobs, which are double insulated, but they are in an incredibly extreme exposed windy environment. It kind of just shows you though, what can be done. Um, I know you can get an amazing nectarine or like amazing peach crops. For me, loads of grapes, grapes struggle. If I'm growing like a dessert grape, the difference between outside and undercover is like day and night. With a polytunnel, there is a little bit of maintenance that you have to do every year that's a little bit different to growing outside. Firstly, you've got this covering behind you and what can happen over, over the year is like some algae can start to grow on it and that's going to limit the amount of light that can get through into the plants and when there's less light, there's less photosynthesis, less growth. What you want to do is either around this time of year as in late autumn, but usually I do it more towards late winter, you want to wash both the inside and the outside of the cover with some warm soapy water and then give it a hose down. And when you do it, you're like, sometimes you look at it and you think, no, nah, it doesn't need a wash, it's fine. And then you do it and you think, wow, I'm really glad I gave it a wash. So give it a daily wash, <laughs> daily wash. And so give it an annual wash, again for me, usually 
that's towards the end of winter ready for the new growing season a bit of a spring clean and keep the pathways nice and mulch keep the pathways nice and clear and also when you are washing the sides of your polytunnel it's a good idea to look out to see if there are any small tears or rips because you can get polytunnel repair kits it's like a special tape that you then put over to ensure that those tears and rips don't continue to grow in size. For me, a polytunnel can act a bit like a, a hub of the garden because you've got all of the seedlings that are coming out that are being produced to, to plant up the rest of the garden. You've got a space that you can sit back and relax. You've got your potting bench. You're growing some of the most delicious crops within the polytunnel. But you can also use that potting bench to store things like tools. So if you don't have a shed, if you just create a nice simple tool storage area, um, it becomes, yeah, a real hub of the garden, it's one of my favorite things about polytunnels. If you don't have space for a polytunnel or you're perhaps growing on a community garden and they don't allow structures above a certain size, something that you can do is make hoop beds. And I've got a video coming out soon about how to make those. We've kind of adapted James Prigioni style, um, more for like UK measurements and what we can get here. And uh, I'm excited to share that. I think in gardening it's really important to not overcomplicate things and so what I've shared in this video is all of the key things in order to successfully grow in polytunnels, all of the key things to understand and the key things to do and a part, it's like the 80-20 rule, it's like what are the 20% of things that make the biggest difference. This is why I created this video. I want to thank my friend Dave for inspiring me to make this video because he was making a polytunnel and asking some questions and I thought, well, why don't I make a whole video because I'm sure if Dave wants to know about it, I'm sure many other people want to know about it. I've added a bunch of different things in the video description, such as if you're in the UK, places to get polytunnels, but also some other videos that I've done around undercover growing that do help.